Hello Internet! In this video, I wanted to take a look at dependency injection and specifically how to use dependency injection in Unity. Uh, and to do that, we're going to be looking at a project called Zenject. Uh, I've never used it before, so this is going to be sort of me learning how all of this works. I've kind of got their Hello World pulled up for Unity, uh, and we're going to be walking through this and kind of experimenting with some of some of the features of this. Uh, but if you're not familiar with what dependency injection is, it's an inversion of control model. Um, and so what that means is let's create, let's go find like a basic class uh, of test. This, this is a really basic example, but what we want is we want a class that is going to print our name, a player name. Uh, and so what that's going to need is going to need some sort of public player uh, which is going to be the player. And then we're also going to need something to print that player's name. Uh, so let's do public print name. And so like this is, again, really basic example. Uh, and so what we would do is we do like a debug.log of the player.name. Just as like the most basic example we can think of, this is our example. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing here is taking a public player object that has a name and then eventually calling this print name fun function in order to do something with it. Uh, now, typically what you might want to do with this is have some sort of public static player um, <clears throat> that is set from somewhere else. Uh, that works, but it's a little bit messy and the static variables are just a little bit hard to hard to deal with uh, or, or rationalize about at a, at a large scale. Um, but more typically, what you might do is just say the player equals new player foo. Uh, and so now we have this new player named foo that we've just created in this in this test class. And so when we call print name, we're going to get foo back. The problem with this is we're defining what the player is as part of the implementation of this other class. Uh, and so this is like taking your car and explicitly saying it has these wheels and this engine uh, and these brakes and all of this other stuff. The problem with that is it becomes really difficult for you to do anything to that car, uh, or in this case, to our test class. Uh, because now it's all explicitly defined for you, uh, so you can't you can't go to a mechanic and say it, it supports these these tires um, and and has this engine and it needs this oil or whatever. You you can't really do that because you've you've specifically said it does this this and this, uh, and it gets that information from here and here and here, maybe from a specific like manufacturer or maybe tied to some specific player like we've done here, uh, and so. Inversion of control is the idea of flipping that around, of saying this test class expects a player uh, and we're just going to kind of leave it like this. We're just going to leave off this player foo. So test no longer knows what type of player we have. It just has a contract that says, I need a player, any player. Uh, and so we're going to need something else to define a player and publish that or inject it into all of the other classes that expect it to exist. And so that's sort of what dependency injection is about. It's about taking the dependency from being declared as part of the type and having those types know how to fetch all of their dependencies and saying these types can declare their dependencies and we will have some other framework, some other thing that is going to actually resolve those dependencies figure out where they're coming from, and then assign those for the objects that expect them. Uh, and so this is really useful in a number of cases. Maybe we have multiple players, and we want to inject maybe uh, the players from the blue team into this or, uh, list, or we have some sort of other uh, requirements for this. Or uh, maybe you have tests. And if we go back to this and are explicitly defining our player, it becomes a little bit harder to test this because now we have weird side effects uh, associated with all of the stuff being assigned here. Uh, and so we it, it just gets more complicated. Uh, it's a pretty common, I guess, 
design pattern and it's becoming a lot more common, especially on the web side of things. Um, so if you use ASP.NET, that is pretty much entirely dependency injection. Um, Spring Boot on the Java side is also going to use dependency injection. I've actually, I believe, done a video on both of those. I might might be mistaken there. Definitely on Spring Boot. Uh, but but we this is sort of, I guess, the first foray into uh, Unity. So hopefully that's a... A really brief, uh, I guess, description of what, what we're hoping to accomplish here and why we might want to do this. Now we're actually going to take a look at this, and and if anything that I kind of left off, hopefully we'll get into that on the way. Uh, and so let's pull this back up. And I'm just going to throw this onto one of my other screens because it's just easier. And we're just going to jump into Unity. This is actually uh, what one of their sample projects comes with. Um, this entire thing is available on the Asset Store. It didn't compile for me in Unity 2019. They have some flags in their code that you need to actually remove. I believe uh, we should be able to see what those look like. It looked like this. Uh, so if Unity 2018 do this, otherwise do this other thing. And this is for legacy support. Um, Unity has renamed how their particle system works, for example. And so this is supporting the legacy particle system, which no longer exists uh, if you're on an older version of Unity. The problem is it's doing a check on Unity 2018, and we're now on Unity 2019, so this doesn't actually compile. You'll need to take these out. I personally, because I'm on Unity 2019 and I'm not going to be using Unity 2017 or Unity 5 or 4 or whatever, uh, I, I just deleted them. Uh, and so just prefer the Unity 2018 one. And then the compilers go away and you actually get your, your game. Uh, and so this, is, there's two games. One of them is just a basic Asteroids and there's another one. You can play with them if you want. It's on the Asset Store. It's also on their GitHub, which will be in the description. So you can go and grab that. Uh, <clears throat> if you pull it off the Asset Store, you're going to get these sample projects and a few other things. Uh, if you pull it from their GitHub, the sample projects are optional. Uh, and so you can actually leave those off and just pull in the framework and then build everything like we're going to be doing from scratch uh, without having all this extra stuff from their examples. All right. So the first thing it says to do is to create a new scene and then right click inside the hierarchy tab and do a new scene context. Uh, and that's under Zenject scene context. I have no idea what this is. Uh, I imagine we're going to figure it out. It looks like it's going to be initializing a bunch of things. Um, Zenject has the idea of bindings and installers. Uh, and so we were talking about, uh, in that example that I was doing here, we were talking about having something that was going to provide this player. Uh, in that case, that's an installer. In Zenject's world, I guess, the thing that is actually providing all of the dependencies that are injected are installers and there are bindings that actually pull that in. Uh, and so if this was actually using Zenject, we might have like an inject thing. Uh, ignore the fact that it's not highlighting, it's not C-sharp and not in the right project, but this is sort of what you might expect it to look like. And then somewhere else you would have an installer that is publishing that player. Uh, but there we go. Uh, so next thing, create a Zenject mono installer. So let's actually go into our, let's create like a scripts folder, just to kind of uh, keep our stuff separate from their examples. Uh, this is entirely a new project that is just importing their asset. Uh, so hopefully you can get back to what I'm at relatively quickly. Uh, we're going to do Zenject uh, and create a scriptable object installer. I believe that's what we want, mono installer. Okay. So there's two different ones here. My assumption is that scriptable object installer is going to use a scriptable object. Um, and the mono installer is going to be based off of a mono behavior, which means it should be able to be attached to an object, a game object in your scene. And you could do fun things with that. Uh, so they call theirs the test installer. It seems like from what I've seen, the pattern is to name these something installer. Uh, and so installer is sort of like the end bit, uh, just like maybe behavior or controller or uh, something else. <laughs> but, but that's, I guess, 
what we're going to do. So we get this new test installer and for some reason it resets my project view. And if we navigate into this, there is this install bindings thing. Install bindings is, can we actually? No. There we go, better. Okay, uh, that's not defined. Uh, let's dig deeper. This isn't going in the direction that I wanted it to. Install bindings is not, not defined. Okay, there's no, there's no comments here. So this is less useful. Um, maybe the installer has it. Nope. Okay, great. Uh, so you'll need to go look at the docs in order to get this information. But this is actually the function that is going to inject these dependencies. It's what's actually going to install the bindings that we're actually using all this stuff with. Uh, and so when I was talking about putting our player, the actual creating the actual player and injecting it in, this is what's going to do that. So this is actually going to install those dependencies uh, and then provide those for other things. And then Zenject is actually going to take what we installed here and bind those into all of our other mono behaviors that depend on them. Uh, and so what we want to do here is create two things, or at least what they do is they create two things. Uh, they create a container and then they bind a specific type. Um, so I'm assuming it's mapped by type. Uh, and then we do a from instance. So this is going to create a unique type from a specific instance of say, hello world of zero. And it doesn't like, oh, this is a function. There we go. And so what this is doing is the container is some special object that controls the dependency injection stuff. It has a bind function. We're going to bind a, or, or create sort of, I guess, a functional builder style pattern uh, from this. And we are going to say, we're creating some sort of something associated with a string. Uh, and then we are going to say that string type is coming from an instance that should have to match uh, the string type. So if I, I bet if I typed 156 there, we're going to get an error because it's not a string. That is a very long error. Um, but the important part is at the front. So cannot convert from int to string. And then a bunch of extra stuff that, okay, that's a little bit too much, but, but as long as we give it a string, any string, it should be fine. The actual contents of the string shouldn't matter because all we're saying is we have a string that is in our dependency injections context. Uh, and so we should be able to do another one uh, and we're going to do exactly what they're doing. And all they do is grab a greeter, uh, which we don't, we haven't created yet. We will create. <clears throat> And this is going to be as a single. Uh, so there's going to be a single instance of this throughout the entire code. And we're going to do a non-lazy, uh, which I believe means it's going to be instantiated right now instead of waiting until it's required. Um, so what, we'll <clears throat> what might end up happening is let's say we create a bunch of these installers that install a whole bunch of different types. It might be the case that some of those aren't used, maybe not in the scene or even not in the game for whatever reason, but you may still be injecting them or, or installing them in this case. If that's the case, typically what's going to happen is it's not going to create those for you until it actually needs to. By putting non-lazy here, we're saying create that right now. Uh, and that's sort of what's happening. Uh, so we have this greeter that we're going to need, but this is our installer. This should be, according to their docs, everything we need. Uh, they, yeah, that's pretty much it. So the next thing we need is some class that's going to do something. Uh, and so what we're going to do is create this greeter class. And this isn't a mono behavior. This isn't going to be attached to any object. So we can actually put it in the same same thing, uh, and part of the reason that we want it not to be a mono behavior and why it's non-lazy is so that this actually can get executed immediately uh, because we're not requiring it anywhere or doing anything like that. We can actually just say, create this greeter 
and create a singleton of it and non-lazily instantiate it so it'll be forced to be created. Uh, this might be useful for, say, like a game controller uh, or, or something like that. This is going to automatically force this to be created, which means we should get all of our stuff into this greeter automatically. Uh, and so what we should be able to do is uh, type the correct keys and do <clears throat> what we're, what's called constructor initialization. There are four ways in Zenject to inject different things. Uh, you can inject on the method, on the constructor, on the field, or on a property. In this case, we're, we're injecting on a constructor. This doesn't, injecting on a constructor doesn't work in on mono behaviors because they can't have a constructor. Uh, and so, so you can't use this if you're doing mono behavior injection. But for this, we're actually just creating a class. So it's fine. And we're just going to say, this greeter requires a string. Uh, and that's that. <laughs> so we should be able to do debug.log and log our message. And so what should happen, <clears throat> assuming, we, assuming we've done all of this right, is we should, why? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I had extra, extra parentheses. But what, what's actually happening here is we have created this greeter class that's saying, in order to exist, I need a string passed in. But we're telling Zenject to create an instance of this. So what it's going to do is say, this class requires a string. So do I have any strings that I can plug in as an argument here? And so it's going to find this hello world of zero argument that we injected first, <clears throat> and then put that as the message for our greeter, and then construct it that way. Uh, so it's going to call this a constructor with hello world of zero. Uh, and this is more complex than just saying greeter hello world of zero. Like we could just skip all of this and just say new greeter uh, hello world of zero. Uh, and for some cases, that's fine. There's there's nothing like inherently wrong with that approach. But again, the goal is to invert the control. Uh, and so instead of declaratively saying we're going to create a new greeter with this message, we're going to create a greeter that accepts any message that is in the system and, and pull them from whatever's providing that. Uh, and so we can actually have like a player be provided again and pull that player out. Um, and this makes it a little bit easier to kind of test these things. But the cool thing with the way we've implemented this, the only Zenject stuff that exists anywhere in this code is up here. So this greeter, because we used a, a constructor-based initialization, it or injection, sorry, it, it doesn't actually use any Zenject code. It's all happening up here, right there. And that's really cool because it means that if we ever want to take Zenject out, we can just use this uh, and, and it'll just work. Uh, and if we want to write tests or something, we can just do that. Um, and it, it just works. Uh, and so that's sort of a nice design feature. It isn't quite as nice um, if you're using method or uh, field or property initialization uh, of the injection stuff. It just isn't as nice, uh, but, but it's there. Um, I, off the top of my head, the way these might work if you wanted that would be to use the inject uh, annotation. Uh, and so that would look like inject. Uh, these can be public or private. So public string message, for example, will inject a new hello world of zero message into this. Or we can do a private, uh, and that will work. Uh, this can be properties as well, and it, it should function as well. Uh, but that is 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 that. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're getting a little bit sidetracked, but that is most of the code that we need. I think that's all of it, actually. Uh, and so what we need to do is add this test installer to our scene. Uh, and so we're actually only on the third bullet point of their, or fourth bullet point of their Example, we are right here. <laughs> Add your installer script to the scene. Great. Okay. <laughs> so let's uh, add it to the scene. 
uh, as its own game object or as a, on the same game object as the scene context. So we can just create a new game object and let's create a test installer. So this should create that, that test installer for us. It should behave like a mono behavior. That would be my understanding of this. Uh, and so <clears throat> we can actually double check, but my understanding is this inherits from mono behavior. And it, it does. Uh, which means we can actually like add properties or fields to this and then they'll show up in the inspector and uh, you might be able to use them if that's, uh, I guess, useful for that. Uh, that might be actually an interesting way to kind of inject like properties and like customize them in one object and then push them to other things throughout your scene. Um, we can explore that later though. Um, add the reference to your test installer to the properties on the scene context by adding a row. Okay, so let's do this and we'll just drag this over. So you do have, it, it seems like you do actually need to automatically or assign these manually, which is okay, I guess, but a little bit clunky. You can probably, probably tune that down by consolidating the installer into something else, but that's the way it seems to be. Uh, add a reference to your test installer to the properties. Open up test installer and paste the above code. We've done that. Uh, validate your scene. So this seems to be some sort of analysis tool, some sort of, uh, I think, static analysis tool to run through your scene and make sure things are actually working. Like, we're injecting this thing. Uh, does it actually work? Or more accurately, What's likely to happen is we might forget this first string binding. Uh, so we can actually test this. So let's uh, actually let's get it. Let's make it work first, and then let's break it, and then we'll we'll see what the difference is. Uh, and so according to them, under their edit, zenject, validate current scene, uh, we need to save it. So scenes. Uh, test scene. Great. <clears throat> All scenes validated successfully. Okay, so that that's good. Uh, I'm seeing that you can't see it in the console. Uh, so that appears as just a debug message. Uh, then we should be able to break it. So what this means by removing that first string injection there's no longer a string for this greeter to receive, which means it should break. We, we shouldn't be able to actually do this initialization. Uh, and so hopefully it will complain and we'll, we'll see bad things happen, which is good because it, yeah. Okay. Unable to resolve string when building object with type greeter. That's fantastic. The messages are actually useful. Uh, and then the second one is just saying there are errors, look above for, or look below, above, but anyway, look for errors. Um, and so this is actually kind of useful because it's saying the greeter class does not see a string being injected, uh, which means the installer that's supposed to be installing that string isn't, which is good because uh, we took it out. Uh, so what this means, hopefully, is that everything works. And so there's also this validate then run, which is control shift R. And so what this is going to do is validate the scene and then run it in the Unity editor. <clears throat> and we see in here our, our message, our hello world of zero, which means that our greeter actually got invoked and printed its message out. Uh, and I think that's pretty much, pretty much everything that, that we need to do in order to actually get this working. This is, in my opinion, like a, a better way of doing uh, scene managers. There's some things that don't fit well with dependency injection, uh, but th those kind of come and go. Um, but what I've seen a lot is like you have a game manager class. Uh, that's not right. <laughs> there we go, game manager.cs. And I, I see people do like static, float, player speed, it, it, this kind of thing, where there's a bunch of public 
uh, static int score, things like this, like global variables that exist ac across your game. And this works, this is fine, but then you end up like breaking the isolation of your components uh, and suddenly you have this giant monolithic thing that needs to know everything about your game. You can avoid that using this Zenject model because now you can just say, I need something that has a player score. And so we can create a player score class that stores all the components about a player score, is able to like increment it or add to the player score and maybe get the current player score or the high score or whatever. And anything that needs to actually use that high score can require that and everything else can ignore it. Which means all of those other things that would typically be using this like game manager class that has all of this extra baggage don't need it and can kind of avoid it. Uh, the downside is this is easy. Uh, and while this is a less code, coming into a new code base, this is not obvious. Um, and so that I guess that's something that I would caution you about. Um, dependency injection can be confusing if it's not well documented what's going on or where this stuff is happening. Uh, and so the, the key parts, I think, are this scene context. Because everything needs to get collected here, it means that you'll actually be able to see, hopefully, what's actually happening. Um, and I think that's probably the most critical part. Anything that isn't here, um, so if I, can I remove this? Yes, so if I remove it, we no longer have any mono installers. We shouldn't, if I'm thinking about this whole thing correctly, see anything, assert hit, Found null installer in context. Okay, so that's failing because this is empty. Now the list is gone, great. Uh, <laughs> you can't have null installers, that's good. Uh, but everything runs here, but it doesn't display our message. Uh, and so I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is you need to be able to look at the scene context and kind of understand how your game works. Um, and, and so hopefully, hopefully the scene context gives you a way to kind of consolidate all of that and point people to where everything is happening. The, the I, I'm cautious that this might become a little bit big. <laughs> there might, there might end up being a lot of things here and that might be less, less great. Uh, but on the bright side, it, it, it seems to kind of can, bring all that stuff together. Otherwise you might end up with somebody who decides that they're going to write a player class. So like, let's turn this into our player. And suddenly this is our player controller, but instead of using a mono behavior, they're gonna use a mono installer because they can. Um, and it, it's a mono behavior, so you can we can put a start in here. Um, so we can do public start, do this, uh, and public update, do this other thing. And you could write an entire player class in here and also have it install these bindings. That would work. Um, probably don't do that. <clears throat> um, unless you're installing your this it itself, that might make some sense. But it, doing this is going to, to muddy the waters of what's actually going on in your code. Uh, because suddenly you're going to have these strewn all over, uh, and I don't, I don't think that will lead you in the right direction. I could be wrong. Um, that that this is more of a hunch than uh, something that I've experienced in Unity. It's just something I've seen in other code bases. So I've rambled long enough about this. So I'm going to leave it here. But I think this is something that I'm hoping to invest in a little bit more. There are some other applications of this. For, for example, there are VRTK bindings, I believe. So you can actually use this with VRTK and pull in a lot of the, the different VR components to actually make this work, which is actually really, uh, I haven't actually looked at it, so I should 
I, I should probably mention that, but it seems like a really handy way of doing VR because you have different controllers, for example, like you have your Vive and your um, Steam VR um, Valve Index thing um, and your Oculus Rift and, and all these different things that have different controllers and different headsets and different capabilities. You want to be able to inject whatever the current thing is. Uh, and so that, that might be a good use of this. But anyway, I'll leave it here. If there's questions, I'm sure sure there are, because I probably have missed a whole bunch of things. Um, but I'll try to try my best to answer them, and we'll probably dig into this more as like a concrete use rather than just like in it, walking through the examples. This has been me my first steps into this platform, uh, and and I'm pretty happy with it. It it seems it seems like it does what I want. Uh, and it seems like it it won't cause too much problems, so uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll give it a shot. Uh, but yeah, if there if there's more stuff you want to see, or if you have other questions about like other frameworks that we should take a look at, let me know in the comments, and I would love to love to check them out. Other than that, uh, if you haven't already, come check out our Discord. We have a Discord. There's like a a bunch of people there that talk all sorts of different things from programming to just gaming and other other things. Uh, and so if you want to want to join that, come and do it. Uh, we yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'll leave it here. So until next time, see you, internet.